Erev Tov Chavim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And if you have your Bible, I'd love to turn with you to Psalm chapter 89 and verse 8 and 9 is the ones we'll be looking at this evening. I'll also be taking you over to the book of Genesis, the book of Matthew, uh, the book of John, Exodus, uh, let's see, Luke, Samuel, and uh, I think that covers all the books we're going to go to. So, Anyway, I, I trust it will be a blessing for you and um, uh, very, very interesting message, no doubt. Uh, you know something, let me just share with you a little something that happened to me early this morning. Uh, I woke up from a very interesting dream, and I don't share dreams very often, but uh, this one is quite fascinating, you might say. Uh, I was sitting with my wife uh, in our living room in the dream here, and we had two visitors, actually three visitors. Uh, it was Pope Francis, uh, John Kerry, and there was a woman there as well. I did not know her name, but it was definitely John Kerry and Pope Francis that had come to our home. And uh, it's very strange because, you know, sometimes you'll dream a dream and a person that really doesn't look like that person will, but you know it just kind of represents them. This wasn't the case. This was literally John Kerry, Senator John Kerry, as well as Pope Francis that were sitting in our living room. And they had come um, to try to get me to sign a document. And I looked down, I can still remember it as clear as day, the document that was sitting before me. And they were trying to get me to sign this document. And the Lord revealed to me in the dream that they're trying to silence you. And that's what the document was for. If I signed the document, they would have the power to silence me. But I wouldn't sign it. And so as they were leaving, they go out to their car. They still appeared to be kind at the time, but they were very persuasive in wanting me to sign this document. John Kerry was standing at the side of the car. Pope, Pope Francis, though, by the way, he never said a word. Only John Kerry did all the talking and trying to get me to sign this document. As he got to his car, he spoke to me from the car. I stood at the front door of the house there, and he says, I'll, my secretary, you can send, the, send it to her once you've signed it. I'll be watching for it. As soon as I get it, I'll get back with you then. Needless to say, I will not make any covenants with the Vatican or with the United States, either one. I don't know what you think about that, but it's uh, just kind of an odd type of dream to have, especially so vivid and so clear. Anyway, let's go right down to the book of Psalm. This is a message, by the way. These are little insights. Many of these I've shared with you before. Uh, it'll be new to some of you guys. Some of you that are new to listeners to our channel, you've probably never heard these before, so it might be very interesting to you. But God has showed me another one, another Another little tidbit from the Bible that clearly identifies that Yeshua was indeed the Messiah. Something that the Jewish people, my Jewish brothers and sisters that are listening, these are things that we should have recognized and we would have known. Our forefathers would have known that he was the Messiah had we took these into consideration. Let's take a look at Psalm 89 verse 8. O Lord God of hosts, who is strong Lord like unto thee? Right? Who is strong like unto thee, or thy faithfulness round about thee? Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. Now, let me just, let me read this to you a little bit. I want to just share it from the Hebraic language for you. That one last little part right there. You know, when the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. See? Basu uh, galav. See? When, when, the, when, the, when the waves rise up, basugalav, ata teshbarchem. See, you calm them. You put them at rest. Shabbat, it's from the word Shabbat right there. Tashabbat chem. You will make them rest. As Jews, we should have recognized who he was. Do you remember, and, and I, let me just look back at the um, at the screen scripture on this here in the New Testament here in, in the book of Mark verse or chapter 4 verse 39 it says and he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea peace be still this is Yeshua now Jesus saying 
Because he goes out there, they're on the ship, they think they're dying, and, and, and they, they said, Master, care us not that we die. And he comes up, and he puts his foot on, on the edge of the boat, and he says, Peace be still. And the Bible says, And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And there's another place I recall, maybe it's in Mark here. I, I, I kind of just copy these and put these in one word document here. But they said, even the winds and the, the, wind, the wind and the waves obey him. What manner of man is this? It should have been obvious who he was. He was the creator standing on the earth. You know, don't, don't misunderstand me. I certainly believe that Yeshua was the son of God. But notice what it says here. Let's go back to verse 8. O Lord God of hosts, right? O Lord God of hosts, verse 8, right? Uh, in, uh, it's in verse 9, actually, in the Hebrew Bible. Yahuwah uh, Elohai Sabaot. See? That's God's divine name. Hashem Elohai Sabaot. O Lord God of hosts, of righteousness. See? Mimocha. Chasin, yeah. Right? What does he say? Who is a mighty one like unto thee, O Lord? There's no one like him. But it's God's divine name is represented there. And then what does he say? Thou rulest the proud swelling of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stealest them. And they wondered, what kind of man can make the waves be still? You know, the apostles knew that David had said this psalm here. They were aware of this psalm. But you know, there's many more. For those of you that have maybe never listened to a lot of the older videos that I've done, let me just share some more with you. Go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, or brooded over, or hovered over the water. Is that not right? God, the Spirit of God, Elohim, in Hebrew. Let me take you to that in Hebrew as well. All right, let me go back here. And um, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, uh, says, uh, See, the Spirit of God. It brooded. The Spirit of God just hovered right over the, the waters. Well, <laughs> again, here we see God hovering over the face of the waters there. And notice that's Elohim. Elohim is the plural for God. Because God manifesting himself the way he chooses to manifest himself. Now, I still, like I said, don't confuse it. I know God Almighty, the self-existing one, he brought his son into this world, Yeshua. But here, God is manifest inside of his son, making the world known to himself, the Bible says. Notice what he says here. Now, we read that the Spirit of God hovers over the, over the face of the waters. And according to Matthew 14, 25, And the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Isn't that kind of interesting? They thought it was a spirit. Well, even in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it was the Spirit of God that hovered on the face of the waters. Again, what was Yeshua doing? He was showing them that he was there in the beginning. He was there in the beginning of the creation when God said, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness. Let's move on to another one. Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. See? In Hebrew, ipak pa'av nishmat chayim. He breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. The chayim is God's own life in a plural form. And he formed that man from the dust of the ground. He breathed in that body Chaim, which is God's own life in a plural form. Why? Because Adam was mankind. He was both male and female. 
And in that one body, God had to breathe a plural form of his life in there because there were two in the same body. That's why it's Chaim instead of just Chai. Because then he says man became a living soul. Nefesh Chaya. That was the singular. That applied to Adam himself. Now, let me just show you the, the parallel to this, though. In John chapter 9, verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Now notice what he says. I must work the works of him that sent me. Remember what Yeshua said to us in another place? He said, the works that I do, you shall do also greater than this, for I go unto my Father. Now Yeshua says here, I must work the works of him that sent me. So what was he doing? The works that God did. God walked on the water or hovered over the water. So he hovered over the water. He did what the Father showed him he could do. When he said, peace be still to the waves, God could say, peace be still to the waves. David identified that God would say that and here this man Yeshua is standing on the earth and he says peace be still and the winds and the waves obey him just like David said it would he says here in John 9 chapter 9 verse 5 as long as I am in the world I am the light of the world verse 6 when he had thus spoken he spat on the ground and made the clay of spittle and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay now he said, I, uh, what did he say in verse 4? I must work the works of him that sent me. God himself taken the clay and he formed a man and made a body and he breathed in that man. He breathed it into his nostrils the breath of life. And now Yeshua is standing here. He's got a blind man and he says, I must work the works of him that sent me. And what does he do? He spits on the ground. He forms some clay and he puts it on that man's eyes and tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. What's he doing? The works of Almighty God who can take clay and create with the clay. In this case, he made a man's eyes. A man that had been born blind. Verse 7 in John chapter 9 says, And I said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And he went in his way therefore and washed and came seeing. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. I'm sorry, that, I'm sorry, that's a different one. Hang on. Let me, let me go back on that one there. In John chapter 20, I'm sorry, I, I should have stopped at verse 90. He went and he washed and he came back seeing. All right, into that one there. But let's go back and look again in Genesis 2, chapter 2, verse 7. Notice, and the Lord God formed a man of the dust of the ground. So in the story in John chapter 9, verse 4, 5, 6, and 7, we see that Yeshua is doing the works of his father by creating from the clay, the dust, and given sight to the blind, just like God created a man and made a human being from the dust of the earth, right? All right, then, but he also says, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, what does Yeshua do in John chapter 20, verse 22? Much further down, further down in the story altogether, he says, and when he had sa said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, it should be translated, not Holy Ghost, but actually Holy Spirit. Right? He breathed on the apostles. Let, let me tell you, let me take you to the to that where he says that. I, I want to actually go a little bit more into this one here. Um, okay, John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Oh, I'm, I was actually in the wrong chapter, guys. Let's back up. My apology. Chapter 20. Um, I, I apologize. I was reading the wrong place again. Uh, this is after the resurrection, verse 17. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then uh, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, 
where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood uh, in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said, so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad. Then they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. And again, like I said, notice he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. The same way he did with Adam and Eve. And I say Adam and Eve because Adam and Eve were both in the same body of Adam when God created that body. And it says, He breathed into the nostrils the breath of life in that plural form because both of them are inside of that one body. Okay? And this, again, it's another sign of who Yeshua was. And the, my Jewish brethren, you should have recognized this. Our forefathers should have got this. You know, Yeshua didn't just go around doing things to do them. He did them as signs to show who he was. And he says, I work the works of my father. Oh, my gosh. So many beautiful things that he did were just uh, uh, marks that, it should have, that identified him. Also, look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. And it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. That's interesting. And Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Now, by the way, the, 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 the bush, that's where we get the name Mount Sinai from, is from the bush itself. Sinai means a thorn bush. So Moses was standing there at, the, at a thorn bush. And I don't know if I remember to put this in the video. I, 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 it'd be nice if I could remember it. But I, I, I've taken many times the pictures of those thorn bushes there in Israel. They got them on the Mount of Olives there. Long thorns on those rascals too, boy. And they are sharp as all get us. Well, they made his crown with. And that's the same thing that that, that pillar of fire appeared in was a thorn bush like that when Moses was on the backside of the desert. Right? Now, watch what it says here in verse 4. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. God called to Moses, how? From the midst of the bush, out of the middle of the bush. And said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Now, turn now to Matthew chapter 27 and verse 29. And what does the scripture say here? When they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Now, where, where was God when God spoke to Moses? Out, he was in the midst of the bush, the thorn bush, Sinai. Now, where is God? Making the world known to himself in the midst of the thorn bush a crown of thorns upon his head. And what do we find in another place in the scripture? That he took and he cried out from the midst of that thorn bush, speaking in a language that they could not understand. God was in the midst of a thorn bush. Another sign to the Jewish people. To even us as Gentiles, or the Gentiles. It's a sign to let you know who he is. Look at Genesis chapter 44, verse 12. And he searched and began at the eldest and left at the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Remember the story of Joseph? You know, his brothers come to, 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 to you know, they'd come. Uh, he had not revealed himself as of yet that he was their brother. And he says, when you really, I'll your... know you're true, that you're not spies. He'd accused them of being spies. And so finally, when they're starving to death, their father, finally, uh, Jacob, he gives permission to take the last son so they don't all die. They go down there, they got Benjamin with them, and while they're sitting at the table, Joseph comes out, he's having a hard time, he's fighting back, he sees his, 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 his brother there, his, his full blood brother there, it's from his mother and his father, you know, Rachel and Jacob, it's their child. And so he weeps within himself, he's trying to hold back, and the other brethren that are there, you know, they still don't know who he is. He gets ready to send him away, what does he do? He takes his own cup, 
puts it in the bag of Benjamin. It represented the communion cup. It represented where Judas would betray Jesus. You'll understand in a minute why. So they put the cup in his sack. On, and then Joseph sends out his servants after they're on their journey back, overtake them, they overtake them. They start from the eldest all the way down to the youngest. They find the cup in Benjamin's bag. His brothers are all panicking over it. Why Benjamin's bag? The innocent brother, the one, he had nothing to do with selling out his brother. There's a couple of reasons why. Just like today, the Jews of today, they had nothing to do with the crucifixion of Yeshua. But yet we're found with a cup in our bag. What will we do with this Jesus called Christ? In another way as well, it speaks of the Benjamites. Because even though Benjamin was innocent, God also knew that the Benjamites would cry out for his blood. They said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. They offered him for a sacrifice. God said, I, I desired not flesh and blood. But he said, of a pure heart, of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. He said, I delight not in the, in the blood of bulls and goats. But instead, they offered up Christ as a sacrifice. It says in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. See, there's the cup. But behold, he, the, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And Benjamin is the house of Judah, which con consisted of the Benjamites, consisted of Judah and the Levites and the Samaritans. And they went into captivity as a result in 70 A.D. Also go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 11. And King David sent to Zadok. By the way, Zadok's name, it means just and righteous. It's interesting. Listen to this. And Abithar. His name means the father of rest. The priest, he sent Zedek and Abathar, the priest, saying, Speak unto the elders of Judah, saying, Why are you the last to bring the king back to his house? Seeing the speech of all Israel is come to the king, even to his house. Remember, Absalom overthrew his father. See, Absalom, it's kind of interesting. Absalom, his name in Hebrew means Avi Shalom. My father is peace. But Absalom never recognized that David was anointed king. And instead, he conspires to overthrow his father. And he's successful in doing so. Now, David could have put the coup down. His men wanted to. He said, whatever you say, Lord, my Lord David, we will do. They were warriors. They had fought many, many battles with David. But David said, let's do not shed blood. It would be too much blood loss. Same thing with Yeshua when he was on the earth here. And, and Peter, Peter took out his sword, cut off the, high, the servant of the high priest's ear. You know, and, and Yeshua says, put away thy sword. He said, don't you know that I could call of my father ten legions of angels and he'd give it to me at once? They were willing to fight. But Israel didn't recognize that Yeshua was the anointed king. Just like Absalom never recognized that David was the king. And instead, they sold him out. Joseph, excuse me. And David, he goes out, goes up onto the Mount of Olives, weeps over Israel. Just like Yeshua did, Yeshua stood there on the Mount of Olives. He said, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. History repeating itself. As David leaves, he goes over the hill, and there's a man by the name of Shimei. Shimei, they're throwing stones at him and at his men and saying, thou son of Belial, You've taken the kingdom from my father, Saul. Well, they wanted to kill him. David's men wanted to kill him. David said, don't leave him alone. God taught him to do this. Why? Because David was a perfect type of Christ. God knew that David was a perfect type of Christ. And later when David, when Yeshua come on the earth, they spit upon him too. They cursed him. 
You notice even, even what happened to Absalom, what does he do? He takes, David takes, not only did he ask Zedek and Abathar to go back, but David left ten of his concubines behind and said, care for my house in my absence. Common law wife. She's not had a proper marriage. My Gentile brothers and sisters, you are like those ten women that were left behind, the ten concubines. This is not saying that in the, in the Christian Bible there were ten virgins. And God gave you the charge to care for his house in his absence. And yes, Absalom abused them openly and publicly, just like the Jews today, many of them openly and publicly abused the Christian people. But in your abuse, you still love them. You still stand with Israel. That's why we have on Facebook, unconditionally, we stand with Israel. Because we know the commission that God has given. Left his ten virgins behind and said, care for my house. Now, I know in this story in the New Testament, five are wise, five are foolish. But in this case here, David leaves behind Zadok and Abithar. They represent the two witnesses. And what did he say to them? He said they were priests saying, speak unto the elders of Judah, saying, why are, the last, why are you the last to bring the king back to his house? Isn't that interesting? The house of Judah is there in Israel right now, according to Zechariah 12. The prophecy said in Zechariah 12 that the house of Judah would be brought back first so they don't exalt themselves against the house of Israel in their home. But he says there saying, why are you the last to bring the, bring the king back to his house, seeing the speech of all Israel has come to the king, even to his house? Could it be that all Israel, the house of Israel, could it be that maybe even this scripture shows that many of them are believing Christians now? And it's the house of Judah that's delaying and calling them back. In fact, God has to send two witnesses, Zadok and Abithar, down to tell them, why are you waiting? When all Israel, see, seeing the speech of all Israel has come to the king, even to his house. What is that? Prayers and supplications. And yet Judah, the house of Judah, has still not invited the king back. So he sends two witnesses to get them in order. Now what does he say here? You are my brethren, you are my bones and my flesh. Wherefore then are you the last to bring, me, bring back the king? And say to uh, Am Amasa, by the way, Amasa, his name means carry a burden. Art thou not of my bone and of my flesh? Was Yeshua not a Jew? Bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. God do so to me and more also. If thou be, and I didn't copy the rest of that second Samuel there, but let me, let me, let me show you though what this is all about. Well, you, know, you know what, let me, let me grab that real quick out of second. I don't want to leave that just hanging there. Second Samuel chapter 19. Verse 13 is where we were reading at just now. God so do to me and more also, if thou be not captain of the host before me continually in the room of Joab. Okay. And he bowed the heart of all the men of Judah, even as the heart of one man. So that they sent this word unto the king, Return thou and all thy servants. You see what those two witnesses will do? Somebody they're going to affect there is going to bow all their hearts as the heart of one man. Then they'll send for the king to return and thou and all thy servants. But what is that a type of? 
Let's take a look at that. In Genesis 2, 23, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, I wanted to bring that out just to show you bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Because, you know, here it is. David is saying, I'm bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. But let's back up to verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. That's Genesis chapter 2, verse 21. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Actually, in Hebrew, it says one of his sides. And the side which the Lord God had taken from man made he woman and brought her unto the man. So what, what, what is this bone of bones and flesh of flesh? Let me take you to John chapter 19 verse 34 and we'll close right here. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. You see, Yeshua was born on this earth, Mary being his mother, made him bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh to the Jewish people. But it went deeper than that because on Calvary, we see that God made Adam and Eve bone of bone and flesh of flesh, but there was deeper than just that. In Hebrew, when God taken from that man, in, in Hebrew it says, God taken from mean ish, from the fire of God, out of Adam and made isha which is the feminine fire of God, is what she is. And in order for God to redeem us back through Yeshua, God did with Yeshua the same way he did with Adam. He put Adam into a deep sleep and opened up his side and taken from not only his DNA from his side, but he also took from Minish, from the fire of Yahweh, from the spirit, and he made the Isha, the woman who is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. But it was spirit of his spirit. And then Yeshua came, and when he died on Calvary, just like Adam, into a deep sleep. In fact, in Hebrew, the word that is used there is like a coma Adam was in. Just like the doctors do today. They put a they induce a coma, put them in such a deep sleep. And Yeshua's side was opened up by the Roman soldier. And when his side was opened up, that flesh of flesh, bone of bone, but then it released the spirit of Almighty God that was within him. All a, for, a, a prefigure. The tree of life, the way that had been guarded. Remember, Yeshua says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The life is the tree of life. It's Chaim. What was breathed in Adam and Eve's, or, you know, the mankind's nostrils where Adam and Eve were living at, in that one body. He breathed it in there in a plural form. But that way was cut off. And all the children that were born thereafter were born in death. This is one of the reasons why God says to Eve, Tell Adim Banim, you will birth sons, not children, but sons, and they will cause you sorrow and pain. It's twofold. Prophecy is prophetic. Why? Because God knows that Cain is going to kill Abel. The pain and sorrow there is, physical, is not physical. It's in the heart. And even more yet, goes deeper than that. Her children would be born without access to the tree of life. It was the eighth Chaim. Remember, if God breathed, if he breathed into their nostrils the breath of life, the Chaim, where did the Chaim come from? Remember the tree in the midst of the garden? There were two of them, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life in Hebrew is called eighth Chaim. So it was the tree of life that breathed into them because the fruit of the tree of life is Chaim. It's God's own life. Then what is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you might ask? You know, recently the Lord, he still didn't make it quite clear. But he began to show me the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of knowledge of good and evil 
is to hybrid the word. It was a fruit tree, but like today, we're scientists. By the way, this is what they're doing in the, in, in the United States, well, all around the world. They, they, they call it GMO, genetically modified. They try to make you a watermelon that's seedless, but there's no life in it. They make you seedless grapes, but there's no life in it. it yeah, they may taste good, but there's no life in it. And perhaps this is what the tree of knowledge of good and evil was like. It tastes great, but it brought forth death. God said, let every seed bring forth of its kind. That's what God's looking for. Not a hybrid plant. Not a hybrid food. But his life. And we could not bring forth life with children without Eitz Chaim, without the tree of life. And Yeshua restored that back to the human race. He was the tree of life. And he brought forth the way of life. I'm Stephen Benoon. I trust this has been a blessing for you. Don't forget this coming Friday We'll be in Newport Ritchie, Florida. What a powerful conference. They're hosted by Sister Lisa Tesh. Um, check it out. We just did a video on it here a couple of days ago. There's a, you can look at that video there. The information is there. It's about the conference. I forget the actual name of that. Maybe I can pull that up for you real quick just to remind you. Um, but in Newport Ritchie, Florida, the conference... Um, my wife will be speaking. I'll be speaking. Sister Lisa will be speaking. Uh, it is going to be a, it's going to be a punch. It's going to be a powerful punch. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting, especially after having that dream this morning where the Pope of Rome and, uh, and John Kerry show up on my doorsteps. Um, by the way, that video is Don't Hold Back on God's Word. One day I go, that's the video for the conference. It's also a good little message in there, too, that the Lord inspired as I was talking about the conference there that you'll want to see. Um, but uh, I trust this blessing tonight for you. Like I said, be there. You don't want to miss it. And uh, let me just see real quick. I can give you the information also besides the name of the video. Um, it is going, the conference is at the uh, Homewood Suites at 1111 5 U.S. Highway North in Newport, Ritchie, Florida. Um, and if you have any questions, you can contact Sister Lisa Peterson Tesh. Uh, that is also in the description of that video there, uh, and, and we just trust you're able to make it. Or you can email me either one, stephenbinoon at aol.com. Not dinoon, but binoon. I'll put that in the description on this video too. Shalom, God bless you, and uh, hope to see you very soon there, and we hope your rest of your weekend will be a blessing. Good night.